Good afternoon. Um, so the Lord had uh, recently put something on my heart um, that he, he wanted me to share with all of you. And also, um, it was something that a lot of people have asked me about, and that is, how did you start hearing from the Lord? How do you hear from him? How did you start hearing from him? Um, so I want to take you all back a bit to kind of testify that it's been a lengthy process. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. It was something that happened when I started to seek the Lord um, with my whole heart. Um, so just to give you kind of a background, uh, this was right around um, when, you know, COVID happened and there was a, a shutdown and so businesses started shutting down and a lot of us were working from home. Well, it was during uh, working from home that I had received a call one day from the vice president of my company and she gave me this um, this promotion or whatever to a supervisory role and I was so excited about this new supervisory role, but I didn't realize that um, I had kind of made work in idol. I'm no stranger to hard work. I had always um, had a sense of pride for my independence and being able to just manage and not need help from anyone or anything that I had it under control. Um, that was a form of pride for me. And so work I did make in the idol, um, I had kind of attached my identity in some ways to work like, hey, look at me, look at how hard I've worked to achieve the things that I have. So long story short, I, I got this promotion and my my schedule was, you know, log in at at one o'clock in the afternoon, but I was supposed to be, you know, there from one to nine and I would stay on until 11 p.m. and sometimes 12 o'clock and sometimes one in the morning because I was a bit of a perfectionist. And to be truthful, everything in my life had always been in excess. I didn't know how to do anything half-heartedly. Of course, that was going to serve me later when it came to seeking a relationship with the Lord. It would serve me well, but at the time it was not healthy because everything was over the top. Everything was excess. Everything was go hard or go home. Um, I laugh about it now, but that's probably one of the, the better traits that I, I picked up from my father who doesn't know how to sit still. So, um, praise God. Um, so I had this time um, where I was working these ridiculously long hours, but I still managed to go to the gym five days a week, every week. I still managed to get in my Bible and read for an hour plus every day. I still managed to go up the street to the, the plaza. It was like a gas station right around the corner from me. And I would just sit in that plaza and I would worship and I would feel things breaking off of me. And so in this journey, um, I started to regularly fast and it was something that God kind of pushed me into. So I was in this supervisory role and then all of a sudden our training manager um, was leaving. She gave her two week notice and we were all shocked. And they, the management came to me and said, Angela, do you think that you could manage these two roles, not just the supervisory role that we've promoted you to, but we also need you to be the training manager for all the new hires that are coming in and we're rolling out quite a few new projects. And so there's going to be a lot of new hires and, and you're going to be part of the interviewing process. And I was like, whoa, you know, this, this is a lot, but I was excited about the opportunity to what move up the corporate ladder, go as high as I could go, uh, make as much money as, as I possibly could because I was still very much in the world and very interested in accumulating the best of everything, right? And so I had all this this time or whatever that I was I was working, but I made time for God. I made time for God. So now I had this, this fasting that I was thrown into because during the training, 
Um, sometimes I would train three and four people at a time and they all had different breaks and lunch schedules. And next thing you know, I wasn't eating. Keep in mind, I logged in at like one o'clock. I wasn't eating sometimes until around six or 7 p.m. Sometimes I would use those, those break times just to use the bathroom and come right back so that I could be ready for them and on before they logged back in. So the, this fasting obviously is a way for us to crucify our flesh, right? And what is our flesh? Our flesh is that, that carnal part of ourselves that rebels against and rejects the things of God, hates worship, hates prayer, hates sitting down and meditating on, on his word day and night, hates everything having to do with God. You would much rather be watching TV or listening to music or hanging out with your friends. So I got to this point where I, I stopped listening to secular music entirely because I realized the damaging message behind a lot of the lyrics. I also realized that there were a lot of people in the secular music industry um, that didn't have a relationship with God and that they were actually pushing this other agenda. And I could see the evil and the darkness behind it. And so I wanted no part of it. And then I found out that there was music that, you know, was along the genres that I was used to and, and always liked and was interested in where, you know, they were Christian artists and they were amazing. So I just, I changed what I was putting into my ear. And then I lost, I had this like big screen TV that I lost in storage at one point. And so I never bought another TV. I didn't, I didn't watch TV. I know you're probably going to say, what, what kind of a life is that, right? But I, I devoted my downtime strictly to the gym, which I, if I'm going to be honest, I did make that kind of an idol too. I didn't know my limits. So the gym was never, you know, a short little like 20 minute workout. It was an hour plus. It was use the pool afterwards. It was, I didn't, I didn't do anything half-heartedly. So I finally came to the realization that I had been given this power. I had been given this authority and it wasn't any might or power of my own, but it was, it was still accessible to me. And so I got serious about wanting freedom. I got serious about hating my sin to such a degree that I just wanted to be free from it. I wanted to serve the Lord. I wanted to be more of use to him. And I realized that I had these spiritual handicaps, if you want to call it that, or hindrances that were keeping me from God's best. And so I started to perform self-deliverance. Now, at the time, I had a roommate, and we had opposite schedules. So after she would leave, if I was by myself, let's say on a weekend, I would do these sessions of self-deliverance for an hour plus. And I remember this one time where I was just going rounds with this spirit and angry that it wouldn't leave. And I finally, you know, I had, I had watched a lot of um, evangelists. I had studied a lot about um, deliverance and, you know, how, how you are supposed to actually know the name and the function of the spirit. And so I addressed the spirit. I said, why are you still here? What is your legal right? What is your legal permission to me? Like, why are you here? The spirit wouldn't answer me as far as the legal permission. And I said, get out in Jesus name. And the spirit responded out of my own mouth. I can't. I can't. And I said, what do you mean you can't? Why not? And it was, it was a legal permission. So I had unforgiveness and I had to, I had to deal with that because of a lot, a lot of us, we have unforgiveness and we don't even know it. So sin separates us from God. Now I want to be clear that God never leaves us or forsakes us. Where can I go from your spirit, right? No matter where I go, Lord, there you are in the midst. There you are with me. 
That's the truth. But our sin separates us from God. And so there's this divide. There's this separation where God seems far away. And actually our hearts become more hardened to the things of God the more that we're actively practicing sin and embracing it instead of approaching it with, with hatred and, and wanting no part of it. See, that's what repentance really is, is when you're, you're, you feel this godly sorrow in your heart for grieving the spirit of God and you hate your sin. You hate your sin and you want no part of it. So you start to, you start to get closer to the Lord. You start to seek him with your whole heart. It's not a half-hearted effort. It's, yeah, I know I would much rather be doing this. But in order to get any closer to the Lord, in, in order to walk in step with him, in order to let him lead me, I need to let these things go. I need to have no part of them anymore. He says, come out from among them, be ye separate, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've been set apart. You've been set apart and there's a reason for that. You're not supposed to look like everybody else. And so I had these periods where I was doing um, self-deliverance. Sometimes I would do it at the house when my roommate wasn't home or in my car, I would just try to find a place to pull up where it wasn't obvious. Um, you know, somebody might think I'm, I'm actually crazy if you saw um, deliverance being performed by the person who's bound in their car. It looks a little crazy. Um, but my point is, I got serious about seeking God. The, the, the Bible says meditate on his word day and night. I started meditating on that word. I wasn't just in there reading to read. I prayed before I opened that book and I said, speak for your servant hears. I want to hear from you. Lord, magnify your voice over any other voice that would try to speak to me. Lord, what do you have for me today? The, the Bible says, give us today our daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. The bread that I need today is going to be different from what I need tomorrow. And what I need tomorrow is going to be different from what I need next week, which is why we need to be in our word. We need to be in our word. The word of God is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And it actually cuts, it creates a divide between soul and spirit. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so if you're constantly entertaining worldly things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, being everybody's favorite, being popular, going where everybody goes, doing what everybody does, then you're feeding your flesh. You're feeding the carnal part of yourself that naturally rebels and rejects God and the things of God. But when you feed your spirit and you feed your spirit by doing exactly what God says to do, be watchful. Pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Pray without ceasing. Pray in the spirit. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Seek him with your whole heart and you will find him. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. And the closer that I got to God, the less I wanted to be away from him. The closer that I got to the Lord, the less I wanted to be apart from him. Because I knew, obviously because the Bible tells me, but also because I came to the realization that I really can't do anything apart from his divine strength. Because at some point, our earthly strength runs out. We get depleted. Okay, we get depleted. And that is exactly the time. Actually, you need to not wait until you get depleted. The minute that you start to feel low on energy, weary, like you just don't have the, 
the the strength like you're getting tired and fatigued easily that's when you need to get into the presence of god and let him pour into you divine supernatural strength from the throne room something that you can't get anywhere else and so when you when you start to make that time for him when you start to invest in that time with him, God will start to show you great and mighty things which you know not. He will start to trust you with the, the, the mysteries and the secrets and the revelations that are in those pages that when you first picked up because the veil has to be removed off of our hearts and the scales have to be removed off of our eyes. And we have to be born again in order to even see, never mind enter into the kingdom of God. So the Bible is spiritually discerned. And the Holy Spirit is the one who bears witness to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. So the best way for you to get to know him intimately and personally is to be in your word. And to have um, time where you're just sitting in his presence. So I'm going to give you a, another thing that served me well. Now, this was something that I learned. I, I had heard this Bible verse before. And I never really knew if there was a specific formula for prayer, how we were supposed to enter into it. But there is, and the Bible gives it to us. So one day I was watching Isaiah Saldivar, and he was talking about this Bible verse. And I remembered the Bible verse, but I never quite understood what it meant. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That's actually a formula for prayer. We should be starting every prayer, not with petitions and requests, but with thanksgiving, with thankfulness, with gratitude for everything that the Lord has done for us throughout an, our entire lives since the womb and what he's doing now and what he's going to do, right? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you should have an expectation that God's going to continue doing these great things in your life. That if he's had his hand on you since the womb and has carried you thus far, that he's going to get you the rest of the way and that you will endure to the end. Not by any might or power of your own, but by the power of his Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And no other way. He said, apart from me, you can't do anything. Jesus said, apart from me, you can bear no fruit at all. And we're supposed to bear fruit that's worthy of repentance. Bear fruit that shows that we really have been born again. Bear fruit that really shows that we have been converted from, from darkness into his marvelous light. Bear fruit that really shows that there's an inner work and a transformation taking place and that we're not the same person that we were last year, three years ago, five years ago. There, there should be improvements. There should be growth. There should be a progression. There should be a transformation taking place. So I, I, I sought the Lord wholeheartedly with, with everything in me. And the first time that he spoke to me, I had just got up. I had no sooner opened my eyes and the Lord had said to me, go see your father. Now, just to give you an idea, me and my father were not on speaking terms. Um... And we were both okay with that. He had said some really hateful things to me the last time that I saw him. I had tried to call him a couple of times because I was always that daughter that was looking for that love from my father who was emotionally unavailable. And then I would just become resentful when I would try to reach out and he would push me away. So I had called a couple of times trying to reach out. He had ignored my phone calls and I said, the heck with him. He can just stay over there if he doesn't want any part of my life. This was my attitude before I was converted, before the Lord started doing this, this transforming work within me. So he said, go see your father. This is the first time I ever heard the Lord speak. And so at first I'm like, what? Why? 
thinking that it, it's my thought. Why would I even think that, right? And he said it again, call out of work and go see your father. And it was, there was an urgency in his tone. And if you want to know how I heard it, I literally heard it like a wind in my ear. And so I, I called my boss and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm going to say because what if they ask me, why do I need to go see my father? I don't even have an answer for it. And I'm not going to lie. But I was like, okay. So I called and I told my boss, I said, I need to go see my father. I need to take the day off. And um, I'll call you later on today and just let you know, um, you know, whether or not I'm going to be in tomorrow or if I need additional time. My manager didn't even question it. She just said, okay, keep us posted and let me know, you know, if you need anything. I was in shock. So I went and I went to go see my father. And that day we had this amazing discussion. Um, I was able to testify to him about uh, my radical conversion at a Brazilian uh, youth service where all they were doing really was worshiping and three hours in I, I got delivered and it was it, it was it, I felt the tangible presence of God all over the place I felt the manifestations of being delivered from all kinds of demonic bondage I felt the weight come off of me I got thrown to the floor about a foot and a half back um, it was it was a radical conversion but back to this um, so when we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, when we follow his instruction, right? The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. He is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And he will direct our paths, but we have to let him do that. So when we listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit and when we heed his instructions, he's more likely to speak next time. But if we don't heed the warning, if we don't follow the instruction, if we start to question whether it's even God speaking to us without taking it back to him and saying, Lord, is this really you? Or just following his leading to see what transpires when, when I get there, right, the first time, even if it doesn't make sense. It's when we quench the spirit and we don't listen to those instructions that the Lord starts to seem far away because sin separates us from God. So it's not that he left. It's that you've caused a divide and the Holy Spirit will actually go silent. If, if you ignore him enough, he will actually go silent. Because truthfully, if you are always trying to speak to someone and give them advice, and they listened and you spent, you know, all this time investing to try to give them advice and, and, and wisdom and instruction that's going to be of benefit to them if they, if they took that instruction or if they heeded that warning. But instead, all, all they did was do the complete opposite of what you said and then keep back coming back and inventing about how their life is so horrible. It's kind of along the same lines with the Holy Spirit. Or he's like, well, I told you um, what you were supposed to do. I told you what would be of, of, of a benefit to you because he he's the beginning and the end. Okay, he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is outside of time. Okay, he's already in your future working out everything that you need, orchestrating it so, oh so perfectly so that when you step into it, everything is already prearranged in your favor that's the kind of god we serve so when jesus ascended to the right hand of the father he said he was going to send us a helper and a counselor the holy spirit wants to help you the holy spirit wants to counsel you but if you ignore the holy spirit's leadings at some point he's going to go silent He's going to stop giving you instruction because you just want to do what you want to do. So I got into this place where I really just wanted the Lord's will more than I wanted my own. 
And I started to pray for that. I started to pray for that earnestly because I realized that my will had never gotten me any place good. My decisions had never produced anything good in my life. They had always caused problems and chaos and the walls would just crash down around me with every poor choice that I made. And I realized that his plans are to prosper me and not to harm me and to give me a future and a hope. And that he actually takes the things that the devil means to harm me and uses them not only for my good, but for the good of others as well. So why wouldn't I want his will? Why wouldn't I want his way? Why wouldn't I want his plan? He says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. His ways are higher than the heavens. We can't possibly understand because his understanding is unsearchable. But he uses the foolish things in this world to confound, confound the wise. And he makes the most brilliant scholar look like a fool. It would be better for us to admit that we know nothing than to try to boast in our own earthly wisdom. So I don't know about you, but I want the wisdom that comes from the throne room of heaven. I want the kind of wisdom that's going to teach me how to shepherd well, how to lead well, how to, how to make a, a disciple that endures to the end. Because I don't want followers, I want disciples. I want people that go, go hard for the kingdom of heaven and are serious about serving them with their whole hearts. Those are the divine assignments that I ask him for all the time. So yes, you have to develop an active and a regular prayer life. You should always approach the Lord with gratitude and thanksgiving. Even if you don't feel like there's anything to be thankful or grateful for in the season that you're in because it's so bad from your perspective, there is always something if you look hard enough that you can be thankful for. You have things right now that other people are praying and wishing that they had, and they don't. So if you look hard enough, you can find those things to be thankful for. That roof over your head, that plate of food that, that's on your table every day at mealtime, that car that you drive, whether it's a point A to point B vehicle, you still have one while other people are walking wherever they need to go. So we, we have to be thankful, even in the little things. And we have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, even when it doesn't make sense. And there are going to be people that try to discourage you from following what God said, if you share with them what God said. But we're not to look for the approval of man. The only approval that matters is God's. And so when you follow his leading, and it is truly his leading, when you get to wherever he sent you, it will all start to make sense. Because God is not a man that he should lie. And he doesn't, he's not the author of confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. So if you got an instruction and then you went out and did exactly what you thought God told you to do and it wasn't God, none of it would make sense and you would be confused about why did I come here and I don't understand. He said this was going to happen, but then uh, that's not what happened at all. So yes, we are to test the Spirit and the only way that we can test the Spirit is by the Holy Spirit, by knowing that we've been born again, by knowing that we've been converted from darkness into His marvelous light. By knowing that he's, he's not just the savior of our life, we've, we've made him the Lord of our life as well. So you get into this, this posture of seeking him wholeheartedly and knowing that every single time you draw near to him, he will draw closer to you. And that when there's a, a certain level of trust established where he knows that he can trust you with the little things. He said, when you're faithful with the little things, then he makes you ruler of much. He's not just going to send you out. You know, here I am, send me. 
if you're not ready. The Lord is not going to send you out if he knows when he does. You're going to fall flat on your face because you're not ready for the type of pressure or the responsibility that's going to be required and expected of you. He loves you that much to not throw you to the wolves just yet. He wants you to be prepared and equipped. But you're you're not the you're not the one um, preparing and equipping yourself. He uses adversity. He uses hardship. He uses difficulty. He uses disappointment. He uses spiritual attacks to reveal to you certain things in your character to say these things need to be worked out of your heart, mind, soul, and life before I can use you fully the way that I want to use you. And God can use anyone at any time. God can speak through an unbeliever if he wants to. So the number one thing is have a teachable heart. Don't ever think that you can't learn something from an unbeliever because God speaks through people all the time. One of the habits that I got into is when somebody said something to me, especially if it kind of hurt, especially if it caused maybe a little bit of offense. I would take it back to God in my own prayer time. And I would say, Lord, something about what they said kind of bothered me. And I know that conviction hurts and I know it's supposed to be offensive and it's, it's not supposed to feel good. So is there any truth in what that person said? What do you want me to learn from this interaction with that person that's going to make me better? going forward. So I started to hear from the Lord more and more, and he can speak to us in so many ways. He speaks to us through his word, obviously. Um, I'm sure many of you can acknowledge that whenever you go to church and it's a spirit filled church and you sit down and you listen to that sermon, it feels like it's tailor-made for you. It almost feels like the pastor knows what you've been going through the past week. And so you're, be, you're, you're being given these instructions or you're being convicted in certain areas where you know you could have done better. And it's almost like we have that thought, how does this man know my life? Well, that man behind the pulpit doesn't know your life, but the Lord does. He knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. That goes one better. He, he doesn't just know the good works that you do. He knows the motives behind the good works that you do. Because sometimes we can do good things and have wrong motives. Sometimes we can do nice things for people, but it's really to benefit us. And so the Lord will show you the thoughts and intents and motivations of your heart why do you really do what you do praise God for those revelations because we wouldn't be able to see them the heart is deceitful and wicked the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful and it's wicked and then the next verse says who can know it well praise the Lord Jesus Christ that he knows our heart and God knows our heart very well he knows us better than we know ourselves. Before we were formed in our mother's womb, he knew us intimately and personally. Amen. So you've got to get to that place where you have an active prayer life. You've got to get to that place where you're meditating on his word day and night. Now, I know there's some people that are going to say to me, well, that's great. You have all this time now, but I'm telling you about a time where I didn't have all this time. I'm telling you about a time where five, maybe six days a week, I was working 10 and a half, 11 hour days on average. And I still made time for God. I took the, the downtime, the me time that I could have used for anything else. And I put it into meditating on his word day and night, having an active prayer life, self-deliverance, fasting, getting into a regular process of crucifying the parts of my flesh that just get in the way of everything that God wants to do. 
So my question to you is you want to you want to hear from God how bad do you want to hear from God? Bad enough that you're willing to give up the things that you love so much. Bad enough to sacrifice things that maybe you you would rather not let go of. Bad enough that you're willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. Bad enough that you're willing to take that little blueprint that you made, that idea of how you want your life to be, and crumple it up into a little ball and throw it in the trash and then set that thing on Holy Ghost fire and forget all about it. To acknowledge God's plan for your life and embrace that one. How bad do you want to hear from him? Do you want to just hear from him because you need a prophecy for today? Because you can't stand the thought of not knowing? See, I used to be in that trap, that trap of having to have the answers and that trap of not liking, not liking uncertainty and, and, and wanting to know from one day to the next what to expect. And I actually, actually fell into the trap of astrology. And because some of it seemed like it could be accurate, I thought that I was getting some sort of leading. And that's really what I wanted. But again, how bad do you want it? You're not going to get accurate leading from horoscopes. You're not going to get accurate leading from psychics. You're going to get demonic instruction from those things. And how many of us know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy? So there's, there's no instruction that you're going to get from those avenues right there that's going to benefit you in the long run. It might look that way at first. But there's a hefty price tag behind it that you don't want to pay, I promise. So sometimes we have to be okay not knowing and not having all the answers until God can trust us with those revelations. He will give you revelations. He will give you divine assignments. But he has to be able to trust you with it. And you need to understand that once you have a greater, a greater responsibility, a greater expectation from God, he's going to hold you to it. So if he gives you a word to speak and then you freeze up because there's so many people around, you're worried about how they're going to react, respond, reply, or, you know, how you're going to look. We, we don't live to please man. We can't live to please, please man and be a, a disciple of Christ. We can't care, care about what other people are going to think. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. So if he gives you a word, would you be faithful enough, no matter who it's for, what it says, or how many people are present, when he says to speak, you got to speak. So before you start asking God, here I am, send me and, and, and speak for your servant here, is realize that there is a responsibility attached to that. There is an expectation attached to that. We will never be saved by good works. We are saved by grace through faith and justified by that very same faith. But the Holy Spirit enables us to do these, these good works, these mighty works. But you have to go through a process of, of sanctification, a process of cleansing, a process of uh, the circumcising of your heart, right? It's almost like a spiritual surgery being performed on your heart where certain things just need to be cut out of it and removed because they're a hindrance. So it's great that you want to hear from God. But are you willing to invest the time into a close and intimate and personal relationship with him? Laying down your desires for other things during your downtime and making him top priority. Because that's what we're told to do. Seek first, primarily, before anything else, the kingdom and what? His righteousness. 
the righteousness of Christ, to become more like him, to think more like him, to walk more like him, to respond more like him, to react more like him, to be as merciful and as loving and as forgiving as Christ. And that takes time. It's not a, it's not an overnight thing. It's something that's entrusted to us. Faithful with little, ruler of much. When you're faithful with the little things, he knows that he can trust you with the larger revelations, those great and mighty things that you know not that he wants to show you. But he needs to make sure that you're responsible enough to have that knowledge and not use it for selfish gain, selfish ambition, or become prideful and, and puffed up in your own mind because how many of us know that pride comes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall? God might be protecting you before from a fall by not revealing these things to you because maybe he needs to make all those crooked places straight. You know how it says he makes crooked places straight in the Bible? That word crooked in the Greek, it means prideful. Pride will get in the way of everything that God wants to do in and through you because then, unfortunately, what, what ends up happening is if you're a prideful and he sends you out and it's too soon, you would become puffed up and arrogant and egotistical and full of yourself and forget that you're powerless without him and start to take some of that glory for yourself. And that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. And any one of us could fall into that trap if we don't pray against pride and ask God to humble us if need be before that becomes a real problem. So again, how bad do you want it? Are you willing to invest time in the Lord? Are you willing to get into God's presence and to sit in the silence after you've ushered into his, his presence? And how do we usher in his presence? Again, enter into his gates. Start that prayer with thanksgiving and gratitude. And then his courts with praise. Praise him. Praise him. If you don't know how to praise him, go into the Psalms and look at how King David spoke to the Lord. That, that's how you praise the Lord. So get into a habit of speaking to God the way King David spoke to the Lord. Praise him for all that he is and all that he has done and all he will continue to do. And after that, you have ushered in his presence. Once you know you're in the tangible presence of God after praising him, then you can begin to petition your requests or lay your burdens down. But my suggestion is just sit in the silence. Sit in the silence. Let the, the tangible presence of God literally like wrap you up like a hug in heaven, like a warm blanket fresh out of the dryer. Because you will just melt in his peace. His peace surpasses all understanding. It means it doesn't make any sense. There's no logical explanation for how we can be that peaceful. When, when our life is in complete chaos and nothing is going our way. And we're, we, all, all kinds of spiritual attacks are coming up against us on the daily. But yet we can still enter into his rest. But there is no rest for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. So if you want to start hearing from God, that, that's the best way to do it. You have an active prayer life. You enter into those prayers with thankfulness and gratitude. You make time for him. You seek first his kingdom and his righteousness in order for all other things to be added to you. And that means all other things will fall into place. All the lines 
for you will fall in pleasant places when you make God your number one priority, when you put him first, when he is the first thing on your mind when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you think about when you go to bed. And you know what? I'm guilty of, of not giving him the time that he deserves or making him that priority. But he has a way of showing us when we traveled away from our first love and when we're not giving him what we did in the very beginning. He has a way of telling us, come back, come back, my son, come back, my daughter. I miss communing with you. I miss fellowshipping with you. I have many things to tell you. Abide in him and he will abide in you. Apart from him, you can't do anything. Apart from him, you are powerless. But the Lord wants to, he wants you to rely on his divine strength. He wants to instruct you. He wants to counsel you. He wants to lead your life. But you have to let go of those things from your past. And that includes relationships, friendships that you may have had for a very long time. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you to leave those friendships, that's what you need to do. And the more that you heed his instruction, the more you will hear from the Lord.